In a previous video, we used gravity as a metaphor to explore the relationships of 4 and 5 to 1. This video introduces basic techniques for connecting these three chords through voice leading. What we're going to tell you is going to sound counterintuitive at first, but it'll pay great dividends over time. Basic voice leading should be boring. There are several reasons for this. 1. It's quite difficult to manage four voices at the same time, such that they're easy to sing and also make interesting lines. This is why counterpoint studies begin with only two voices. 2. Countless musical situations require voice leading that doesn't draw attention to the inner parts. Imagine writing for a hundred people playing at the same time in an orchestra. It's impossible to give all of them interesting lines, the result would be chaotic. On the contrary, simple voice leading is very useful in filling out secondary parts in orchestration. We don't want those background lines to distract from the main lines. Finally, for vocal ensembles, boring voice leading is the easiest to sing, so any professional composer needs to be able to supply it as needed. With these reasons in mind, let's think about voice leading from a perceptual standpoint. Recall the introductory lesson on general principles, and in particular, those of auditory scene analysis and pattern recognition. How do humans distinguish multiple sound sources from one another? As Albert Bregman's research on auditory scene analysis shows, the brain has several criteria to attribute sound streams to their respective sources. One criterion that has serious implications for voice leading is closeness of register. When sounds occupy the same area of the staff, they're more likely to be perceived as coming from the same source. If our goal is to write blended harmony and not elaborate counterpoint, it's preferable for voices to be fairly close together, normally not more than an octave apart, and also they should move as little as possible. This principle is sometimes referred to as parsimonious voice leading, and ensures that each voice stays in its own lane, so to speak, while nonetheless forming a blended whole with the others. If voices were to leap about haphazardly, we'd have more trouble parsing the texture into its constituent auditory streams. So what about pattern recognition? A texture that moves mainly by step, or simply stays still on common tones, also creates a norm of stepwise motion. And when our brains become accustomed to voices moving by step, any leap creates a salient contrast and a bump in the texture. We'll discuss how to use leaps effectively later on, but the first order of business is to master stepwise voice leading. This brings us to our first voice leading principle. In general, voices should move by the smallest distance possible. In this progression, the soprano and alto move by step. The tenor stays on the same note. Note that the bass has to leap in order to match the Roman numerals being expressed, 1 and 4, in root position. That is to say, with the root of each chord and the lowest voice. If leaps can lead to unwanted bumps in the texture, it should come as no surprise that other voice leading decisions can lead to unwanted holes. Such is the case when two voices move in parallel unisons, octaves, or fifths. They sound as though they fuse together into a single voice, causing one perceptual voice to momentarily disappear. For those of you interested in music perception and cognition, this effect can be attributed to the auditory phenomenon of harmonic fusion. For our purposes here, however, it will suffice to state a second voice leading principle. No two voices should move in parallel unisons, perfect fifths, or octaves. Note that this includes compound equivalents of these intervals, such as perfect twelfths. Parallel fifths and octaves can arise in many different progressions, but as this example shows, they are especially common in movement between chords whose roots lie a step apart, like four and five. In the first progression, each voice of the four chord moves to five by step, but not without creating parallel twelfths between the bass and tenor, and octaves between the bass and soprano. To avoid these parallels, the soprano voice must leap down by a third, as seen in the second progression. Despite containing this leap of a third, this solution is the most parsimonious option. It also maintains the essential independence of the outer parts. Whereas parallel octaves and fifths create holes in the texture, Octaves and fifths in outer voices, soprano and bass, can also sound bare depending how they're approached. Look at the following example. 
Even though the outer voices don't contain parallel octaves, the octaves are approached by leap in both voices from the same direction. The combination of consecutive leaps, similar motion, and the hollow sound of an octave makes the octave stick out, since leaps always call attention to what follows. There's nothing wrong with this in and of itself, but context is paramount. An octave like this could be appropriate as punctuation at the end of a phrase, but it could cause a seemingly random distraction if placed haphazardly in the middle. The same principle applies to the perfect fifth, as seen here. One way to soften the accent is to move the most salient voices, like the soprano, by step. In general, don't approach octaves or fifths in the outer voices by similar motion unless the soprano moves by step. Unlike 1 and 4, the 5 chord contains the leading tone. As we saw in our last lesson, this special note has a strong tendency to move up to the tonic. Your voice leading should reflect this tendency. Hence, our fourth voice leading principle. Resolve the leading tone up by step. This requires special attention in minor keys where the distance between scale degrees 7 and 1 is a whole step instead of a half step. In order to harness the gravitational power of the leading tone in minor, you must raise scale degrees 7 as shown here. Important exceptions to the lean tone principle we explored in the next video. Many of you will have noticed that each chord expressed so far contains some kind of doubling. This is because triads contain just three notes, but chorale style requires four voices. Which notes should we double? In general, any note of one or four can be doubled, but composers should pay special attention to the quality of the result. Doubling the root of one, for example, provides a more grounded sound, appropriate for an ending. The 5 chord isn't as forgiving. If we were to double the leading tone and resolve each up by step, we'd create parallel octaves. A doubled leading tone also colors the chord very strongly. Thus, in 5 chords, avoid doubling the leading tone. Even though we've covered so few chords so far, we can achieve satisfying musical results by combining our basic voice leading skills with the principle of composing out. This passage for string quartet uses repetition and rhythmic variation to create an expressive hymn-like gesture with just one, four, and five. Remember that basic voice leading exercises are not an end in themselves. Always experiment with rhythm, tempo, textures, dynamics and the like. Discover how even just three simple chords can take on myriad characters when we allow our imaginations to run free.